So um, I'm just going to start off in prayer and we'll see what happens. God, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for just such uh, an amazing, amazing work that you're doing here and the amazing work that you're doing in our lives. And, and we're just so excited uh, and we anticipate something great to happen tonight through um, the teaching of or the book that Stephen Furtick has put out, Sun Stand Still. There's just so much you've already given to us in weeks past. And but we were excited just as much tonight as we've, we've been over the last few weeks. So pour out into us, God, tonight. Fill us up that we may go out and pour out. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so we're on uh, day 19. And I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, and how many of you are enjoying this, this book or this devotional? Let me get a raise of hands. Yeah? It's been good. I mean, it's been challenging. And one of the things that I've, I absolutely love about what we're going to go over tonight is the fact that it covers the first two weeks of the F series that we've been going through. There's actually talk about both faith and fear in a few of these weeks, which I was really excited about because that's how God works. You know, you step out and you do something in faith and then God backs it up again. And even though we step out in faith and even though we are go through things in our life, sometimes we're not prepared for things that happen. How many of you understand that? And that's the joy about walking by faith. You know, I'm going through some stuff right now that I've never, I've never experienced before in my life, but I have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding and I trust that God has everything taken care of. Even though things can get really crazy, God's in control. Amen? Amen. And so I'm excited about this. Um, and the title of this chapter is The Surcharge of Sacrifice. A high calling for your life is God's gift to you. It's not something you earn. And we talked about that in, in regards to faith. Uh, we've been talking about faith without works is dead. We've been talking about saving faith. And saving faith, it says grace through faith. You've been saved by grace through faith. It's not something that you work to earn. That is God's gift of salvation for you and I. And so we, we see that in God's greatest gifts are free and we receive them. And then we show out of the overflow of our life, uh, we show the fruit of that salvation or the fruit of the, and the benefit of what we've received. And so what a, what's such a great, what a great faith that we've received from God that we didn't earn this thing. And that's the beauty of it. You know, I've earned multiple things in my life, but I guarantee and I can testify that the greatest things that I've ever received have been things that were free and, and they've been given by God. And a lot of times when God gives them through man, I know they're from him because they're better than anything that I would have ever thought of myself. Right? And that's how God works. So, but you don't get to participate in a high calling without paying a high cost. See, that's, that's our side of it. That when we respond to God's calling, you know, there's a cost that we, that we pay in our life through sacrifice. It says you will, in fact, pay a tremendous price to operate in a great anointing. And the level of your impact will be directly proportionate to the price you're willing to pay. This, uh, this, circum this circumcision involves God cutting away everything in our lives that doesn't bring glory to him. How many of you have ever had God cut something out of your life that you didn't think at the time was a good thing, but afterwards, number one, you realize that God was the one that did it, and secondly, after you realize that God did it, then you realize how good it was that it was cut out of your life. Amen. And that's how, that's how God works. And, 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 um, and so, and those are the things that don't bring glory to him. You know, these things that draw attention to ourselves, you can quickly identify those things. And some things we're not willing to let go of. And the cool thing about God's grace is sometimes he just cuts them off. He just cuts them off because he knows they're not, they're not good for us. Stripping away our pride and self-reliance. If we're going to live lives based on believing God for the impossible, our hearts will have to be circumcised. All right? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what the cutting away process will look like for you, but remember this. When God cuts something out of your life, it's because he wants to bring something better. 
Something, sometimes God has to let your dream die so that his vision for you can come alive. And, and that's interesting. We talked about dreams last night, and, and some of us have fed old, dark, twisted dreams because we're used to seeing, we're used to having those kind of dreams, and, 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 and even just dreams in our life, the things that we can tend to make things up that we think are dreams, we dream for ourselves. I'd much rather have dreams from God than have a dream of just my own doing. And it's much greater. Um, and, and once you've made up your mind to pay the price and to trust the Lord with all your heart, no level of spiritual achievement will be out of reach. Because when you want God, what you want, God wants for the reasons he wants it. Let me read that one more time because I got kind of... All right, because when you want what God wants for the reasons he wants it, you're unstoppable. I like that. A high calling often exacts a high price, but it always yields a supernatural return. You know, I've been, we've been talking about living by faith, and, and a lot of times when you set out to live by faith, or when you set out to live a sun stand still type of a life, which is a life of faith, you begin to recognize that things don't always go your way. And see, that's tough for us because we're used to, as human beings, getting in our flesh, we're used to trying to manipulate and control things to be comfortable enough for us to go through them. But the thing is, is there's no growing in that. There's no real uh, blessing that comes with that. And, and, and some of you have heard me say this, but it's like, if, if, if we were always supposed to be comfortable, then we would never need the comforter, the Holy Spirit. The reason why God gave us his spirit is because he knew we were going to go through uncomfortable situations. And so we need the power, the power of the Holy Spirit the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to go through situations that are uncomfortable and the Holy Spirit brings us comfort in those situations. And, 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 and the thing about God is there's always a yielding of supernatural return far above anything you could ever ask him for or think of. What is, good, what is God calling you to sacrifice or cut out? You know, oftentimes you hear this in regards to offering, right? You hear, you know, if, and, and this is not a bad thing, I think it's great. If you're a, a coffee addict and you spend $10 a day on coffee, and some of us do that. Some of us have two really nice, awesome Starbucks or Dunkin' or whatever it is. Well, Starbucks, it's two drinks for 10 plus. For Dunkin', you can get, a, you know, three or four drinks. But whatever your addiction is, if it's coffee or tea, sometimes if, if you're looking to invest more into the kingdom financially, those are typically things that we look to to cut out, right? You want to give an extra $100 a month? Cut out coffee. Cut out, a, you know, whatever. Something for that month, you can sacrifice those things. But what does that look like in your life? What kind of times are you spending uh, with doing things that you know are literally just a waste of time? Right? I mean, we do things and we invest time, we invest our resources, we invest uh, our efforts into things that don't really matter. And then we're wondering why aren't things happening the way that we believe they're supposed to happen in God's timing? It's because we're spending our time and our resources on other things. What is it that God is calling you to cut out? And see, in Joshua 5, 2 and 3, it says, At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. Again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeath Haraloth. And I don't know what circumcision is like on a second round, but I could only imagine that that would just be absolutely amazing and supernatural. At least the feeling. And I'm just going to move on from there. Day 20. <laughs> Building on hope. I'm just in one of those, I'm just, I'm in one of those moods tonight. And, and I think God's in one of those moods tonight. All right. A lot of people confuse faith and hope. And I wish I could have got into that, uh, tapping in to faith. And there's so much, like I shared about on Sunday, there's so many it's interesting looking back on the video for Sunday night, talking about how it's, it's difficult to, to talk about faith in 30 to 45 minutes. 
And then you end up going over and talking about faith. And, and for some of you that were here Sunday night, you got a chance to experience that firsthand. <laughs> and there's, but there's a dynamic of this thing that I think is really, was really awesome when I was reading this about faith and hope. It's like, like a lot of people confuse faith and hope. They think they're walking in faith when actually all they're doing is standing in hope. You ever just stand there hoping, hoping something will happen, hoping something will happen. And like we talked about Sunday, God brings an opportunity for you to exercise faith. It's not what you think it should look like, so you don't tap into it. You just stand there hoping. You just stand there hoping. And then you miss the, you miss the faith boat. You know, you're supposed to ride on the faith boat because the faith boat is going to take you somewhere where you're going to be able to see another level of faith that you never saw before. But a lot of us are so comfortable living in the level of faith that we have that we forget that faith is immeasurable. Faith is immeasurable. So we try to measure faith based upon what we can see. But if you base it upon what you can see, you end up getting all jacked up and getting depressed and all sad because things aren't happening. See, in a walk of faith or living by faith, things happen and it's wonderful. But it also becomes terrifying sometimes. And we don't want to face those terrifying moments in faith. But we have to embrace the terrifying moments of faith. Because it's in those moments when, when terrifying things come against you that faith is activated and you can come up against those terrifying moments in faith. Well, how do we ever exercise our faith without an opportunity? Right? Right? So, um, it, it has really helped me to look at it this way. Hope is the blueprint. Faith is the contractor. So when I hope for something, my faith is the connection between my hope and the manifestation of that which I'm hoping for. The more I study scripture, though, the more I detect this distinction. Hope is a desire. Faith is a demonstration. Faith is a demonstration. You know, Jesus was a perfect, he gave us the perfect example of what it's like to live by faith. And he continued to give glory to his father, right? Jesus, the son of God, continued to give us an example of what it's like to live by faith, to live by love. And then whenever, whenever anything amazing happened, he gave glory to the father and pointed to his father in heaven and said, this is, what, this is my father's business. This is kingdom work. What's happening before you right now and what's happening in your midst at the moment that I'm talking is God is moving, God is making a way, and God is doing something spectacular. If you could only grip it by, if you could only grab a hold of it by faith, it would see you through to the next season. Amen? And so, but faith is a demonstration. And so hope wants it to happen. Faith causes it to happen and acts as if it's already done. But remember, hope is not faith. Like hope, it operates before the fulfillment, but it's active in trying to help bring that fulfillment about. So it's not bad, it's not a bad thing to hope, but it's not probably the greatest idea to just stand in hope alone, not stepping out in faith. And, and, and so we see, are you hoping for something without action? So he, Hebrews 11.1, 1, this is what I thought was awesome. It's just, we're just tagging along with stuff that we've already uh, been talking about. But faith is a confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. And, 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 and last night we talked about uh, living in a life of addiction. What is, living, what is living a life in recovery matter if there's nothing to really hope for, if there's no end result to your recovery? If there's no trusting in a higher power, or in our, in our case as Christians, in Jesus, if there's no trusting in Jesus to restore us to sanity, then there's no stepping out in faith believing God for anything. So for me, hoping that God will restore me to sanity is also trusting in faith. I'm not just going to hope that I'm going to get restored to sanity. I'm going to believe that God is capable of doing it and he's going to do it. And he has done it about 95%. I'm almost there. I'm almost completely sane. Today, 80%. Like now, 80%. An hour ago, 50%. <laughs> Day 21, faith forensics. 
Well, let me, let me finish that second half of Hebrews 11. One says it gives assurance about things we cannot see. And then day 21, faith forensics. Faith forensics. How has your faith been developing in recent days, months, or years? Maybe it hasn't been developing so much as decreasing. Maybe you've adjusted your expectations to believe that God is no bigger than the accomplishments of your human effort. What kind of faith is that to minimize your faith to your own human efforts? A lot of us stop at where our human efforts stop, and then we begin to hope. But then we kind of stop there. And we don't really tap into the power of God where we can leap out or step out or walk it out in faith where we, we actually begin to see something happen. And so we, we get weary and tired and we give up. And that's typically the cycle of an average Christian. But see, we're not called to be average. We're called to be supernatural. We're called to be extraordinary. And we're called to really do something beyond what we can see our own human effort. But I believe God wants to raise the stakes on your faith. So many Christians live in a state of chronic and perpetual discouragement. Like I just said, things don't seem to be going well, and we don't expect anything miraculous from God. What kind of life of, what kind of life of faith would it be if you never expected anything from God at all? I mean, a lot of people like, you know, I'm okay with where I'm at. And I'm okay. If God doesn't do anything else, I get it. Like, I'm okay. But really, if you dig down deep in my heart, if God doesn't do anything more than what he's already done, I am okay with it. Partially. The other part of it is I'm really not. Because I, there's a, if I'm honest with you, I'm, I'm expecting God to do more. Because I don't want to just see, I don't want to just see a hundred beds. I want to see, I want to see 300 beds. In fact, I don't want to just see 300 beds in Serenity Village. I want to see 500 beds. I don't want to just see two, three, four hundred seats. I want to see a thousand seats. Why? Is it because of numbers? No. But it's about the miracles that God can work in a thousand people's lives in 500 beds. That's my God. My God can work way beyond anything that we can ever think of or imagine. Faith is not a drug to sedate you, sedate you through a life you hate. I absolutely love that. Like highlight, somebody highlight that and make a plaque. Oh. Like, I'm serious. It needs to go. We got two of the American flags. The other one needs to go. This needs to go right there. No, I'm just kidding. But it's a really, it would make a cool plaque. I'd hang it up. Or, a, or another sweatshirt. Bumper sticker. Whatever. Sorry, I'm going way off. But I love that. Faith is not a drug to sedate you through a life you hate. It's, a, it's not a magic pill you, to make all your problems go away. In fact, quite the contrary. It's a force to transport you to another realm of reality. It's a, it's a, faith is the kind of thing that takes you from the moment that you think nothing is, could ever possibly change, and it takes you to the place where you know that that's not going to be the way things are forever. It, I remember when I was incarcerated for the first time, and my mom said, when she came to visit me, go look, go just count the rocks in the brick. Just count the little pebbles on the inside of your cell to pass time by. And I, and I often, I, you know, and the funny thing was, was I did it. <laughs> I did it. I mean, I, I sat in there and I'm like, but the thing is, is even in that, even in that time, the reality is, is that I'm there. So how can I change my mindset in my heart during these moments where everything seems hopeless? Like my first jail stay, and, and, and I know people that have done prison time standing on their head, and maybe some of you have, but I'm talking my first jail stay was like hell. I literally felt like I was going to be, like it was an oven. My first day, I felt like I'm going to lay in the bed and like all hell is going to break loose and like fire is going to come. And they're just going to consume me. I'm going to be gone. Right? Like you get, your mind gets going and then you start to live in fear, which is a whole nother message we're going to be going into. But, but what, what is it? How can we be trans, transferred into another realm of reality? It's by faith. It's by faith. And a lot of people use faith as a coping mechanism. And faith is not a coping mechanism. It takes you out of it. 
It is your weapon of mass destruction to win your spiritual warfare. How can you battle against that depression? How can you battle against that loneliness? How can you battle against that that seemingly unchangeable situation? See, the purpose of faith is to change your situation for the glory of God. So on the one hand, you have some people who think faith means nothing bad will ever happen to you. Apparently, they've never read to the, in, the end of Hebrews 11, where the Bible talks about, which I want to encourage everybody, if you've never read Hebrews chapters 11 and 12, like take the time tonight, probably only take you 10 minutes to read it. But by the time you start reading it, they'll probably be stuck in it for an hour or so. Where the Bible talks about people who were sawn in half for their faith. Because of their faith, not in spite of their faith. Not because they didn't have enough faith. When we read crazy things happening, it's like Paul was in prison. Why? Because he sold an eight ball and got busted? No. See, Paul didn't get, Paul didn't get busted on a bad dope deal. Paul, Paul was in prison for his faith. Right? Paul was in prison for his faith because he really believed that what he was believing in, who was, which was God, which was Christ in him, the hope of glory, was worth dying for. Is the faith that you have now worth dying for? And if it's not, I would question the faith that you have. Have you suffered because of your faith? What a great transition. Hebrews eleven thirty six through 38. Here, here's, here's an interesting, um, sign me up, sign me up for this. Some face jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. Yes, um, this is the Bible, right? Hebrews 11. They, they went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. And I want to, I'm going to share this really brief. I, I did a study on this whole, when they went about in sheepskins and goatskins. Literally what happened to these Christians was these sheepskins and these goatskins were literally sewn into their bodies. Does that sound crazy? Like they stitched them into their bodies and made them wear them as a shameful thing. They were a shame to the nation. And that sounds wild. And there's other examples of what that, when they went about in, how, how would these people, you ever thought about that when you read it? Like they went about in sheepskins and goatskins? But that's what it was. And, and, and they, they were looked at as the scum of the earth. And the world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. So if you wonder why sometimes you feel down in your Christian life, it's because of this. It's because it's the reality of life. Sometimes it's just not going to go your way. And people aren't necessarily going to like you. I mean, they got sawn in two. That's pretty crazy, right? What, what good would faith be if you never needed it in the darkest valleys of your life? After all, the one we model our faith on went to a cross because of his faith in his father. On the other extreme, there are people who hold on to faith like a passy and a blanket. See, faith is not a passy and a blanket. Let's just clarify that. Day 22. What are you, af- what are you afraid of? What are you more afraid of? The high cost of failure or the higher cost of of missed opportunity, the pain of messing up or the deeper pain of missing out, making the wrong decision or deciding by not deciding at all. I like that. Have you ever, have you, have you ever made a wrong decision based upon not making a decision at all? Falling down, falling down or standing still. We've decided that often it's better to regret something we did than something we didn't do. Serving God will cost you something, but there's also such a thing as opportunity cost. What you miss out on if you fail to act. Don't let your fears, worries, and self-doubts prevent you from acting on the vision God has for you. The cost of faith is great, but the cost of unbelief is much greater. I like, I'm going to go back to this. Don't let your fears, worries, and self-doubts prevent you 
from acting on the vision God has for you. And, and, and we probably went over this a dozen times already in the last week or two about you know, not allowing our emotions or the things that we see dictate what we do in faith. Because when God calls you to something extraordinary, uh, oftentimes there's that faith. It's not a blind faith. It's actually a faith because faith is really having a deep conviction that God is for you, that God exists, that God is in control, that God cares about every detail of your life. So if that's the kind of faith that you have, it's an activating kind of faith that moves and, and, and does something. And, and, and so when you, get fa- when you get faced with fear, you come against that fear with your faith. And you say, I don't, I don't understand why I'm, I'm feeling this fear, why I'm afraid to do this, but I know that this is not a godly kind of fear. We're going to go over the difference between ungodly fear and godly fear on Sunday. But uh, you got to discern, is this a fear of the Lord? Is this a, am, I, am I going up into this thing because I reverence God, or is this something that's coming against me to get me thinking down about myself, about the things I know I'm supposed to be doing? Where is this thing coming from? And then you battle it with your faith and you do it. And the worries and the, and the, and the doubts, like sometimes we, 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 we have confidence and all of a sudden we get, we get kind of close to what we're supposed to do in faith and we stop there. We stop there because then we start worrying, we start doubting, we start, you know, having all these different questions pop up in our mind. Is this something that, you know, that I'm even capable of doing, but I'm telling you, if God's calling you to do it, he'll, he'll, he has probably already prepared you for it, but if he hasn't, he will give you the grace for the areas that you lack to do it. Does that make sense? And so what are you afraid of? Can you just, can you just step out in, in faith? The cost of faith is great, but the cost of unbelief is even greater. The cost of unbelief, it's even greater because what happens if you step out in faith, believing God, and all of a sudden it just doesn't go your way at all? Sometimes it's not that God blows your mind with something above and beyond you ever asked, something you ever asked him for or thought of when you step out in faith. Sometimes you step out in faith and you don't, you don't see any, no results. Sometimes for years down the road. But that doesn't mean that it's not, that it's not faith. The faith is, is it's, it's waiting and continuing to believe that what God said is much greater than what other people and what other, when other things are coming against that says. All right? So unbelief, the cost of unbelief is much greater. Are you hiding what God wants you to invest? In, 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 I know this was an uncomfortable situation. Some of you were here Sunday night. I talked about when I, when I tucked away uh, a whole bunch of money in a medicine bottle in a plant, a, a fake plant with real soil. Anybody remember that one? Yeah, that wasn't like a message that went off too well with some. But here's the deal. It isn't, a, it, I'm not, I want to please God when, when God gives me a message to deliver. I want to please God with the message. So there, there's, there are times when God challenges our faith financially. And I'm sorry, some people get uncomfortable with that. But the reality is, is I've tested it out and God has proven himself to remain faithful in the sacrifice. And, 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 and so when we hold back, guess who loses out? You do. I do. And, and I know what it's like to hold back from God. I, I, I lose out and, 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 and other people lose out. Because when I get blessed, when God blesses you and I, guess, guess what? You don't just benefit everyone benefits. And it's just, it's a blessing that just keeps flowing. And so are you hiding what God wants to invest? Luke 19, 20 through 21. Then another servant came and said, sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. What's your view of God look like? Is your view of God that God is some hard man? Taskmaster, taskmaster that's ready to whip you down to size? Or is your view of God, God is somebody who is more than willing to help you through your fears, your failures, your objectives, all that stuff? God is more than able. Or do you see him as a hard man? Do you fear, do you fear God because you, you feel that he is hard and, 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 and he's, you know, mean? Like, that's not the right kind of fear. That's not the right kind of fear at all. 
And, and a lot of people get God twisted. And even in their time with God, they feel that God is, you know, slapping them down and laying the smack down and, and, you know, tying them and beating them and in the spirit. And I've heard people say that. And I don't think, I don't think that's God. I don't see God doing that to his, to his children. What he does is he lovingly, when, when, when God disciplines us, you know, it's discipline, right? Because you get, you get put in your place and God does that, but he's got a way of doing it. That's good. All right. So day 23 wave jumper. It demonstrates one of the most common patterns in scripture. As the big waves roll towards us, God promises to do the heavy lifting. He only requires that we have the faith to wade in as deep as he leads and to keep reaching out to him, up to him. It may be your job to cross over, but it's God's job to see you through. And if you'll do the believing, God will do the achieving. Not only... Not only are you not alone, but you're not even primarily responsible for the outcome of your obedience. That's what I love about obedience is because when you step out in obedience, you, you don't even know the result of that, what that outcome is going to look like. See, sometimes we do something because we, well, you know, you, you think that you're going to get something. And then you, when you step out in obedience and do it, you realize, oh, wow, I wasn't expecting that. Whether it met your expectations or didn't, it was probably what God wanted for you. I'm going to say that again. If it, it may not have met your expectations, but I guarantee it was what God, what, what God wanted for you. It was what you needed for that time. You ever ask God for $10,000 and only got two? Maybe. It depends. If maybe you got two. I got 2000 <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. But maybe, maybe, maybe you got, maybe you were believing God for, maybe you're believing God for $10,000, but he gave you $2,000. Like, would you be offended by that if God gave you that? Like, what did you need 10 for? See, and I think that's what growing in faith is like. You know what I mean? Like we grow in faith and we start to recognize what we really need. Sometimes we only need $2 for real, right? But we ask for 10 grand. Your heavenly father has a firm grip on you. His vantage point is way above the water level. He's, he's bigger than you, he's stronger than you, and he's got you. It gets even better. When you, when you get down to it, you're not the one holding on to him. He's holding on to you. He, and, 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 I, and, and I remember when I was reading through this, he gave the example of, I believe it was him and his son, and they were... They were jumping, they were jumping waves. And I know because when my kids uh, were young and we grew up, I mean, they grew up and we were living right next to the ocean. And so we spent a lot of time at the beach. We lived in Daytona Beach. And so when, when we would go to the beach, I'd always hold their hands and then the waves would come. If I just left them standing in front of the waves, it would knock them out. But if I lifted them up and jumped, guess what happened? There was smiles on their face. There was laughter. There was all. Why so much joy? Why so much laughter? Well, because my daughters knew that I had a firm grip on them. What happens when I just let go and I just let them dangle like, hey, this is funny. Like, is that God? Like, if I did that to my kids, guess what happens? They start to freak out a little bit. See, some of us have that reality, we have that thought process about God just dangling me over the wave, hoping that the wave will nail me just to kind of tease me. But that's not my God. That's not the God who loves you, who cares for you. God has a firm grip on you, tighter than you have on him. Amen? Are you doing your part so God can do his? Exodus 14, 14 through 16. Have I gone about an hour and a half yet? All right. The Lord will fight for you. The Lord will fight for you. I'm almost done. You guys see it on the sheet. The Lord will fight for you. You, need, you want me to fast forward? All right. We'll fight for you. You need only be still. How do you be still when you just feel like running? I feel like that's for somebody tonight. How do you remain still when all you do is feel, when all you really feel like is just running? Just moving on, right? He says, be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Why? I mean, that's kind of an interesting question. Why are you crying out to me? Why not, right? Well, tell the Israelites to move on. 
raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. See, sometimes the answer to our question or to our prayer could be right in our own hands. Could be right in our own hands. I know many times when I don't have the resources or I don't have the strength or I don't have the things that I believe that I need, I tend to look down and find out what do I already have? What do I already have that I can move forward with? You know, I remember when my wife and I had made a decision to bring in three kids into our home who we absolutely love, who we absolutely adore, and we decided to bring them in, and they wouldn't initially let let them come in because of my record. And then I just, I kept pressing in. I said, no, I'm not taking no for an answer. I believe God's called us to have these kids in my home. And so we pressed through. I don't care if I have a record. I know that God wants us to have these kids. So God made a way when they denied me multiple times. And, 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 and so they're here with us. But when they first came, we had had a little house. We had a little house. And we kept getting turned down to buy houses. Purchase a house, purchase a house, purchase a house. Turn down, turn down, turn down. God, why in the world would you allow them to turn us down? We need this house. And one day, my wife and I are sitting in the kitchen, in the living room. Sorry, in the dining room. In between there somewhere. <laughs> my goodness. And, uh, and we're sitting there, and, and, and my wife turns, Erica turns to me, and she says, I think we could just, I think we can make this work. And, well, what that boiled down to for me was my office was getting out of the house. I would, I would no longer have an office. So I got an office outside. And we had asked some people to help us get some stuff for inside the house. So one of my friends just so happened to have custom doors that fit this wide opening that we needed to make a room. It's like custom doors, okay? Do you get that? Custom? Like cut perfectly for this wide opening that we have to make. So we had this house. We turned it into the place that we were able to bring them in, the the legal requirements for us to have them in a house. We were just over 300 square feet to house a family of eight total, and they approved it. And we just drew the blueprint up on a, on a piece of paper. Why did, we, why did we do that? Because we thought that, that God was going to bless us with a mansion? No, because it was, number one, it was the right thing to do. And because that was stepping out in faith. We did it. We put our hands to the plow and we did it. And now look what God's doing. God gave us an even greater place with much more space and with many more friends and with many more family. And so it's good. I don't even remember where I was. Was it day 24? (laughs) Is that where I'm at? Day 24. Up to here in fear. Anywhere there's great faith, and I'm starting at the beginning, right, you guys? All right, we're good. We're We're doing awesome. You guys are doing great. There will also be equal and opposite fear. So when you reflect on God's vision for your life, it's natural if you feel overwhelmed. It's natural. The people who accomplish the most astounding things for God's glory aren't the people who feel the least fear. Often they're the ones who deal with the most intense amounts of fear. But instead of letting, I I don't know about you guys, I'll be completely honest with you, I, I can attest to sleepless nights. When God's moving, I'm not even talking about being gripped by fear, forget about it. I'm talking about knowing that fear is coming up against me and stepping out in faith and staying up all night because I'm so excited about what God, how God is going to move in, in that step of faith. I've stayed up many, many nights with not anxious and all twists and crazy, but in faith. And maybe some of you have done that in fear and, and it's not downplaying that because the level of fear that can come up on you will give you restless nights, but I guarantee that a restless night in faith is far greater than a restless night in fear. Much greater. All right, now keep keep going here. What? Where am I at? Second second line? Okay. Uh, Often they're the ones who deal, okay. But instead of letting that fear disable their dreams, they start increasing their capacity for faith. Increase your capacity for faith. That's an encouragement. They act on the part of God's direction. 
they do, they do understand. Okay, let me do that again. They act on the part of God's direction they do understand. And they leave the rest up to him. What we see as a permanent condition, Jesus sees at a, as a temporary circumstance. What we see as the end of the story, God sees as the beginning of our most miraculous chapter, of our most miraculous chapter. Don't be afraid, just believe. God is planning to act on your behalf, and he, here's what it comes down to. Fear is like a telemarketer. The best strategy is to never pick up the phone, ignore it. All right. How many telemarketers do I have in the house tonight? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Any, I mean, that can be offensive to somebody. I don't know. I mean, if we don't pick up the phone and you're a telemarketer, blame been on Stephen Furtick. All right. When you are troubled, when you are troubled, where, where do you find peace? John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Do not give, do not give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. See, God's already given you what you need. He says, peace, I leave with you. See, a lot of times we're praying and asking God for the peace, but the truth be, be the truth of the matter is this. He's already given it to you. He's already given you. He says, peace, I leave with, when you leave something with someone, guess what? Unless you give it back, or unless you leave it down, it's, you have it. So you just tap into that peace, and he says, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. So you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. Day 25, connector to the current. To say that someone is called to full-time ministry suggests that others are permitted to do part-time ministry. There's no such thing as a part-time Christian, and there's no such thing as part-time ministry. Ephesians 4, 11 through 12 explains, and I absolutely love and agree with this, that the only job pastors and teachers have is to prepare God's people for their own personal ministry, for their own personal ministry. I want the people in our church to see themselves as marketplace missionaries. Their profession is, is their pulpit. Your profession is your pulpit. No matter where you go, there you are. No matter where you go, there you are, either stepping out in fear or stepping out in faith. And when you step out in faith, there's something there that God wants to do. You're all, you are a marketplace missionary. Or if you're in the temp agency waiting to get a job, you're, you're, you're not a temporary person. You're not a temporary Christian just because you're in a in, you know, you're getting a job through a temporary agency. You're still looking for a full-time job. So it doesn't matter. Like, who identifies who you are? I know what it's like to have and go through a temp agency to get a job. That's not a bad thing. You're not less of a person because you're going through a temp agency. But here's the thing. We are all full-time Christians, if you're a Christian. And their profession is their pulpit. They are the Im they are the image of God within the sphere of their influence, and so are you. They are connectors to the current of the power of Christ. The grace of Christ flows through them into the lives of those they serve. Are you taking Sunday's message into the world? Are you taking Sunday's message into the world? Ephesians four, eleven through twelve. So Christ Himself gave the apostles, the prophets the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. See, some people, they only look at the pastors and the teachers and maybe the evangelists, but definitely not the prophets or the apostles. They, somehow they just, they're gone, right? If they're gone, and then the pastors and the teachers and the evangelists are gone too. And the gifts of the Spirit and the gifts that God has given to, the, to each one of us inside the church have also been done away with. So that's not true. What's true is God has given gifts to the church to equip the body for the work of the ministry, right? Is this what it says in verse 12, to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So how do we get built up in our faith and in our relationships together? Guess what? We work together. We live life together. See, what does it look like to live by faith with other people? It means you have to rub shoulders with somebody. 
It means that if you are prone to seclude yourself and, and, and move away from other people, it means you're probably missing out on something pretty awesome. And so I, I, I think that the discussions tonight in our groups are going to be pretty, pretty amazing. Um, but I, I want to I leave you with this. Is the faith that you have worth dying for? Right? Like, is this faith that you have, is the, the faith that you have a sun stand still kind of faith where you're, you're believing that God, will, would, God would be willing to stop time for me? See, a lot of times when time stops, time typically stops when I calm down. If I, whenever I'm calmed down, and I'm not just saying that, I'm saying for my, in my life, I realize that, wow, even though time is moving, at the same time time is moving, God gives me just enough time to get done what I need to get done. And the same is true for you and I. In our walk, God is going to give us the time that we need. He's also going to give us everything that we need to keep doing what he's called us to do. God bless you guys. Thank you.